Hello everyone and welcome to today's Big Data Open House. Today's first session is a case study on how a Tier 1 operator successfully implemented a Big Data strategy. Our second session um, looks at the importance of applying context to your data in order to generate information and knowledge from your data. There will be um, a poll during the presentation, so please do take part, and there will be time for Q&A at the end of the session. Please submit any questions throughout the presentation using the text box you see at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. If you'd like a copy of the slides, please do just email Lauren after the session. Um, I'd like to introduce Lauren now, who is Intersex CMO, and he'll be leading today's first session. So, with the housekeeping out of the way, I'd now like to pass over to Lauren. Hi everyone, uh, thank you very much uh, for joining this webinar. I'm uh, Laurent Michel, and as Natalie said, I'm the Chief Marketing Officer of Intersec. So Intersec is a software company. Uh, we're specialized in fast data analytics and customer engagement for telecom operators. So the idea of this webinar is to share our experience on the field. I will first go through some of the common questions and challenges operators are facing when starting a big data project. And I'll share with you the insights we've derived from these issues. Then my colleague Giancarlo will explore a real use case, which is a tier one operator who has implemented our big data platform several years ago and has developed different usages on it for both internal and external needs. And then uh, Guillaume, our solution engineer, will share with you a quick demo of our analytics software and how it applies to a geomarketing study. And finally, we'll be glad to answer your questions at the end uh, of this webinar. So um, before we deep dive in subject, it would be interesting to know a bit more of your background and personal experience with uh, big data. So we've prepared three quick questions Natalie, if you could launch the poll, um, I'd like you to answer the following questions. Uh, first question is, what kind of company do you represent? Do you represent an operator, a consulting company, a vendor, or any other type? Uh, the second question is, um, what is your main function? Is it marketing or innovation? Uh, IT, project management, or others? And the third question is, have you already rolled out big data projects? Uh, or are you planning to, or just thinking of it, or not at all? So we do have some results. So um, I've got them here. So it says, what kind of company do you represent? Um, so we've got an interesting mix. We've got 37% here from consultants. 47% um, are from an other. So it um, would be interesting to know what the other is. But then we have 11% from vendor companies and 5% from CSP. Um, so it's quite heavy on the consulting and other side. OK. And in terms of everyone's functions, it's interesting to see the spread we have here. So the highest percentage here is 39% are project management. Um, we have another 39% which fall under another category, um, which again would be interesting to know. 12% IT, which is surprisingly low actually, <laughs> um, from yep. what I would have thought, and 9% on the marketing side. Okay. And then last but not least, where is everyone with their big data projects? So 40% of you are thinking of doing it, 29% not at all. 20% um, are planning to do it, and 11% of you already are. You are doing it, which is great to see. Okay, very interesting. So we're uh, in the in the uh, assessment yet uh, phase uh, for most uh, most of our audience, and um, uh, yeah, not necessarily the uh, end users from operators, but uh, uh, other types of uh, actors. Okay, thank you very much. So let's dive into, into the, the subject. Um, there's no wonder why operators are all interested in big data. The huge amount of data they collect from networks and IT opens the door to uh, many fascinating usages. 
Uh, here is just a snapshot of some of the applications that we've seen actually deployed around the world. So we can see that uh, these applications involve both revenue generation and um, cost reduction. On the revenue side, they can lead to either internal or external monetization. And on the cost saving side, they impact both marketing, network, prop management, customer experience. And something that has been striking us uh, is that these projects are currently rolled out in all markets, uh, both emerging and developed countries for postpaid and prepaid. I also like to mention that these projects can give birth to totally new services such as, uh, for example, AT&T using uh, individuals' location to prevent banks from fraudulent payments, or Docomo helping car insurance to implement uh, new pay-as-you-drive models. Uh, but they can also enrich very traditional applications like uh, revenue leakage detection, uh, that's the case of Axiata in uh, Asia or customer segmentation uh, uh, like O2 or MTN, for example. And between these extremes, you find the whole spectrum of innovation, for example, in Britain, where O2 dynamically prioritizes bandwidth allocation to high-value customers. Or another example, Turkcell, uh, who uses social data and DPI to enrich its customer segmentation. And uh, predict what product would best fit to uh, such customers. All are fascinating examples, but they raise many questions uh, from a technical, financial, organizational, uh, and even ethical standpoint. So uh, let's examine some of these challenges. First challenge one can think of is a technical one. Collecting such a wide variety of data from so many different sources can look terribly complex. Uh, we're talking about mixing very different silos of data, customer-centric databases, transaction detail records, network information, plus all kinds of data for, from uh, external websites, partners, and so on and so forth. But as a matter of fact, our experience is that these technical questions is, may not be the hardest one to resolve. There are many ways to ingest massive streams of data into a single data entry. Um, and the great challenge may be somewhere else, and it deals with more trivial questions. For example, uh, all these data are generally collected somewhere already. But these collection points were designed for a single operational purpose and not meant to be loaded with heavy queries. So should operators rely on their existing systems but bear with slow response time? Or should they rather shortcut them and build parallel collection directly from the sources? One technical issue, here's another one. Many information is made redundant in an operator's IT. For example, uh, RPUs are calculated in many different systems with different rules um, according to the end usage of this indicator. So the problem is not so much to find where the data is, but rather to choose which of the different sources will be taken as a reference. And whatever the choice will be, they need to bear in mind that it will never be 100% consistent with other KPIs already in place across the company. That's not a technical, uh, uh, that's not a technical problem, ra rather a functional one. From a usage perspective, there is another question to address. Most of the time, examples of big data uh, refer to what we call data lakes storing petabytes of information on the fly, and running from time to time a powerful algorithm on this huge database to get a clear picture on segmentation, on risk, on scoring, etc. But there is another approach which consists not only in storing, uh, but also in analyzing the data while it's still flowing to detect patterns. This fast data approach is particularly relevant when timing is of the essence. For example, to detect fraud, to grant authorization, to notify a customer that he has reached a certain threshold of usage or a credit limit, uh, etc. In that case, those applications require to detect a pattern in real time, but they also require the capacity to trigger a set of relevant actions on the fly, so different technologies for different applications. 
let's now talk about the ROI question. There are two ways in considering a big data project. Either you start small and you build your project based on one or two profitable use cases, or you consider that it's a must for your company to do this project and you build large storage capabilities designed to cope with unknown future use cases. And of course, usually operators opt for a mix between these two extremes, but it's interesting to examine the consequences of one or the other choice. When, when uh, operators opt for a use case approach, they're driven by a clear goal, and usually their commitment to deliver is stronger. And by definition, they are less challenged on this ROI qu question afterwards. However, it can be challenging to find the relevant profitable use case from the start because the business units can have different priorities or because they they don't share the same enthusiasm about the business opportunity than the big data manager. So in any case, our experience is that business plans have limits and the future is never exactly as it was planned to be. So my recommendation is to make sure that both the technical solution and the organization will be compatible with many different use cases uh, far beyond what was initially planned. The other approach consists in storing everything and bets that new usages will emerge from this lake of raw information. And usually this approach provides a larger degree of freedom and enables to try innovative use cases. And it can give a bit more time also to freely explore the data before deciding which will be the next use cases to be rolled out. But our experience is that um, the lack of commitment on ARI can slow down the decision to launch the project or to make clear trade-offs between multiple choices. And the risk there is to have fuzzy objectives that may change in time and slow down the project. So there's nothing wrong about this approach, but I would recommend to be careful that the project team has a strong buy-in from business lines in a clear governance model in order to make sure the project keeps on track. What about the organization for a big data project? Should the organization, uh, the project be based out, uh, be carried out by the IT department or should it be led by a dedicated uh, organization under a function like a chief data officer which is distinct from traditional IT? Of course, there is no uh, uh, recipe, a magical recipe for success. In our experience, uh, whenever IT department leads the project, they benefit from a natural legitimacy in terms of technical choices. They also have a, a larger flexibility on resources because big data projects require significantly less investment than a core IT system. Another consequence, maybe a lower pressure on ROI, uh, and the launch of new use cases. On the other hand, on the right hand side, dedicating a special team to big data projects can be an interesting alternative because it comes with a clear objective and is usually driven by a PNL. Um, mixing different competencies within the same organization can also impulse an innovative mindset with a clear incentive to deliver results the drawback of that approach is that this team may struggle to convince other departments and especially IT or business lines to use the platform rather than alternative solution. So usually this approach is faster to deliver the first result but can lose its momentum after a certain period of time. Another challenge, uh, obvious challenge is the privacy issue. In Europe, regulation is very strict regarding the storage and the usage of customers' personal data, both for internal or even for anonymized statistics. Uh, to give an example, you cannot store the unique MAC address of a passerby around a billboard equipped with Wi-Fi in order to measure its audience. So there is a real technical challenge here, but it's possible uh, to combine privacy protection and accurate insight we do it all the time, and I know many other providers who do it perfectly well. Um, however, our, in our experience, main challenge remains uh, a communication issue. 
think of the damage Apple faced when it was made public that they were keeping record of past location data, or the massive controversy that happens whenever a mobile operator is being hacked and personal data is leaked. Many operators keep in mind the risk for their image to be assimilated to some kind of uh, big brother, keeping track of all their customers' habits and behavior. And this is the reason why some of them prefer to keep a very low profile uh, when it comes to their big data activities. And the use case that we'll present uh, shortly after uh, is no exception to this rule. So, in summary, we have identified several success factors not to be exhaustive. First, uh, break the silos and choose the right way to access uh, the right source of data. Um, check if your use cases are based on pure analytics or if they require real-time responsiveness. You can have a use case approach, but make sure your technical choices can address large variety of applications. Uh, give the lead to IT or dedicated team, both works, but in any case, make sure the governance is clear and that the business units buy the big data project. And finally, address privacy concerns, uh, not only from a technical standpoint, but also from uh, the communication aspect. So to conclude this part and introduce our customer use case, uh, I'd like to say just a few words on the solution Intersect provides. Um, our platform collects data from all types of sources, IT, network, external sources of data, and these data are processed either in real time or on demand. This core framework enables many different applications uh, such as customer base management or customer insights, data monetization, fraud detection, location based services, or IoT management. Um, so. Uh, this is uh, the, the platform uh, that uh, has been used by uh, our customers and I will now hand over to Giancarlo to expose you how one of our tier one operator in Europe has been using it. Thank you Laurent. Hello everyone. My name is Giancarlo Avogno. I am the strategic marketing analyst at Intersec. I will give you now an overview of the use cases we developed with our customer. We chose to remain low profile for the reason Laurent just exposed a minute ago. We deployed our solution to boost legacy infrastructure by providing the big data capabilities to transform the network from a cost center to a profit center. Here you can see some of the metrics that will illustrate the magnitude of the ocean of data analyzed on the fly. For this customer in particular, our solution enabled to collect anonymized location data from more than 30 million devices in real time. This represents around 1 billion mobility events per day. Additionally, these events provide demographic information to be used for segmentation. Let's now have a look at what we are able to achieve with such capabilities. Well, it all started with location-based advertising. The operator was willing to monetize its location data by providing contextual service to its subscribers. Indeed, LBA differs from traditional bulk messaging because the service is a subscription to a bundle of exclusive offers based on personal interest and location. Of course, subscriber opt-in is mandatory for this service and the customer accepts the customers and the terms and conditions and is fully in control of the number of messages to receive over the period of time. We also work very closely with the regulator to make sure to be fully compliant with the privacy regulations so brands can reach the right person at the right place and at the right time. So by creating geofences around the shops and by collecting network events from all opt-in based Whenever the, cross, the customer or the subscriber enters the predefined area, the personalized offer is sent automatically. For advertisers, the attractiveness of LBA is linked to the number of addressable profiles, but also the access to a qualified segmented base. Beyond LBA, the operator lavished the solution to promote the launch of its own 4G network. 
whenever a subscriber equipped with a compatible handset enter a 4G cover area, he or she received a message to activate the parameters to enjoy a, flash, a faster connection. This campaign was extremely successful as it reached a 55% click-through rate. With the success of LBA, the operator realized the potential of transforming these network events into valuable business insights. While this career launched its data monetization strategy by positioning itself in all of the following use cases. For its own internal usage, it enabled to boost operational efficiency by decreasing internal costs with relevant and accurate information. For marketing, by providing customer knowledge with contextual data to increase churn. And for network operations, managing network planning and optimizing investment for it with real-time usage data. With the fuel proven value of these internal usage, the operator launched external services such as geomarketing reports and business insights to different verticals. And with the internal buy-in, the first step of this new project was to historize data and build an in-house solution on top of it. Well, due to the complexity of the tasks and an ambitious times to market, I have to say the operator came to us for a turnkey solution. Let's have a look at some of the use cases implemented now. First, with the continuous collection and historization of anonymized usage and location data, our teams of data scientists develop a library of data mining algorithms to create the geomarketing reports. At that time, the operator was reconsidering reducing actually one-third of its distribution network. With crowd analytics, we identified movement patterns during business hours around each point of sale. And we determined also the best located ones. With that, we obtained an overview of the most visited stores based on factual data without investing in internal studies. This very type of geomarketing study can also be leveraged for external use cases. Indeed, there is a high demand for materials for this type of business insights when it comes to selecting a catchment area for a new store. But a second use case involved the optimization of the operator's supply chain. For instance, for the commercial launch of a new smartphone, the operator, of course, is not able to start selling the device before the date and hour contractually agreed with the supplier. So the challenge for any career here is, well, how do I control my entire distribution channel, right? and make sure that no one will ever sell the device before official launch date. Of course, huge penalties are applied in case of no respect of the contractual agreement. So in this case, the handset supplier was able to see also the activation of any of the new handsets three to five hours after the activation. With our solution, the operator was able to practically control the distribution process by visualizing the headset activations in real time, also by identifying the different point of sales not in compliance, and taking the appropriate actions to avoid financial penalties. Such capabilities also enable the carrier to optimize its supply chain by checking the number of activations close to a point of sales and updating the inventory accordingly. Another example of internal usage can be seen with fraud prevention. For instance, a subscriber would acquire a smartphone with a fake ID and leave the country not paying for the handset. It would take actually several business days for the carrier to verify all the papers, the IDs, and detect the fraud. The fraudster would be calling premium numbers while in roaming and generate a significant loss for the operator. And actually, this particular fraud represents several million euros annually for the carrier. Roaming solutions will take actually from 4 to 24 hours average to detect the usage abroad. But with the collection of the real-time events and the right fraud algorithms, they're also enabled to bypass and count and check in real time for every SIM card, handset, and the phone number to remediate rapidly. <coughs> This is an example, actually, of how big data can provide shortcuts. 
as you have seen so far, field proven results were achieved for internal use cases. Today, Telecom Data is praised for its quality and reliability by other verticals as operators address millions of subscribers. Three major verticals are willing to benefit from this business insights. First, retail, as it is now possible to count the number of people passing by a store and analyze the transformation rates in any given area. So transportation, as we're able to identify alternative routes and evaluate the density of passengers during rush hours. We will see now how the same KPIs can be applied and replicated to different verticals. During a single major event, let's say a car show or a music festival, we can extract several valuable metrics for different stakeholders. For instance, identifying the number of distinct visitors for the event organizer or identifying the most visited halls, also the frequency of attendance, the most visited hours, and the origin of the attendees. For close by retailers, we can inform the most common site visits during lunch hours and provide heat maps based on the population density. For the hospitality business, the duration of stay for domestic and international visitors. And for transportation, the routes and means take the, taken to the event area and the split between visitors by transportation means. With that being said, I'd like to share an example based on this last vertical. Our customer won an RFP for market studies launched by a consortium led by government agencies and transportation companies. The project was to build a railway express line between downtown of a major European city and its airport. It had two objectives. First, to identify the optimal location for arrival and departure. And second, set the tariffs and time schedule for the service. The study actually was conducted over four months with a collection and analysis of one billion network events per day. And of course, all the data was anonymized and aggregated. As the operator had also a significant market share, it was relevant to extrapolate the results to the total population. So with the algorithms developed, we counted the arrivals and departures according to the origin and destination within the country by also time of the day, by day of the week, by transportation mean, whether it was a taxi, a bus, a car, or even a train, by type of traveler, a country national, traveler in transit, or international, and also distinguishing travelers from attendants, employees, residents, and many more. The demo we will be showing in a moment will provide you additional details about this use case. The last use case we will be seeing today is based on IPTV. We collected data from 10 million set-top boxes in real time and analyzed the customer behavior. One key benefit for the, the carrier was to enrich its customer knowledge by analyzing which channels were being watched and when and also by identifying the patterns between switching channels. So from there, it was easy to tailor VOD offers or optional TV packages based on the household's preferences. But mainly, the benefit here was to provide such anonymized business insights to the advertisers. Carriers can benefit from a unique and highly granular data that is already available and provide factual results for audience measurement knowing the number of people who watched an ad or switched the channel. I will now hand over to my colleague Guillaume, who will now present you the demo of our solution. Thank you, John. And hello, everybody. My name is Guillaume Merian. I'm Solution Engineer at Intertech in Paris 
And my goal today is to present you a demo of our analytical solution. This demo session will take place in two phases. The first one, I will present you a use case using open public data. And during the second phase, I will show you how, in few clicks, we create in our solution dashboard with widgets displaying the data collected. Let's go now on the first part of this demo. As I said in introduction, I will show you a study we realized using a sample of open public data. It's important to know that this data was generated by subscriber activities as call emitted, call received, SMS sent, SMS received, etc. And that before any, ma before any manipulation and analysis, all this data was of course anonymized in order to keep and respect subscriber privacy. In this use case, the purpose was to study Paris airport attendance. To come back on the demo, on the graph on the left on the, of the screen, we use an algorithm developed by Intersec which analyzes the path used by each subscriber following his move and his stops through the time. Thanks to that and a correlation with public transport road train trajectories, the algorithm is then able to determine the trajectory and the conveyance for each subscriber. As you can see on the graph on the right, for, for each subscriber there's an associated trajectory and convenience. A3 or A1, which is basically roads, EGV, and area B, which is a public transportation in Paris. On the right, here is the distribution on each convenience through the day. We can notice the importance of the road to serve the airport compared to others. TGV and public transportation, RER, for example. Below this graph is another widget using the same data where we analyze the contribution of national airports, Paris airport traffic. Here we can see that Nice, Marseille, and Toulouse represent the three main contributors of this traffic. Another important thing to note is that this information was cross-checked with the data from French civil aviation and fully matched with its information, proving again that network data is a truthful and important source of information, allowing to make very complex studies on a huge base in few clicks. Then, the last graph is the evolution of the split through the day between the different airports in France. So here is the end of the first phase of this demo session. I will now go through the second part of the demo. We will make a quick analysis of the open network data we collected by showing how to create dashboard in few clicks and get results that could normally take a lot of time by using other solutions. In the first step of, of this demo session, I will create my target. So basically here I want to analyze the number of people located in a specific area of Paris that I will now create. So I will define the zone. I will enter, I will choose three touristic zones in Paris that I will call touristic Paris. And and define three placemakers that I will create directly through a map. The first zone I will create will be a zone around the Basilic Sacré Coeur. I'll draw it directly through the map. 
that. They could actually occur. And we then create a second one around the Eiffel Tower. And then a third one around Notre Dame de Paris. So now I have my free zone. The zone is updated. And I will now create my target. My target, basically, in this example, will be only based on this free zone. But as I will show you, this zone can be also a bit more complex. But for this example, we will, I will show you a simple one. So here, my zone will be the touristic Paris that I just created with you. I will choose Tic Sacré Coeur, Eiffel Tower, and Notre Dame, so you can see it on the screen. And I can also show many other criterias, but for this example, we'll only choose the just the zone I create. My target name. And I save it. So my target is now created. Now that I have created the zone I want to study, I will create my panel on my dashboard. I back to home. So I will create a panel, a dashboard called webinar and a new panel. The panel is basically for a specific type of data and target the information I will display through the different widget I will create. So here, the panel, I will choose the collection. and my target that I just created previously. And I will now create two different widgets. I will create basically two different widgets, a heat map displaying the density in these three areas that I previously defined, and a, a colon chart with MSCSDN split between these three zones. So I will create, first of all, my heat map. Here I choose the size, the size for displaying this information. I choose the set of data. So it's a count of MSISDN. I choose here the heat map and the cell ID, based on the cell ID. So I create my first widget. I will create directly my second one. It's with busy, it will be basically a split of MSISDM. Choose the set of data. Next. Color chart base. and based on the zone I just created previously. So you can see again, I click on Eiffel Tower and Notre Dame. I click on Finish. So I create my two widgets. Now I can move a bit the widget in better, for better visualization. And now I save and compute. Here you can see the time estimation in progress.
And now, you can see on the screen the heat map of density of the free zone I created and also the column charts where you can see the number of people located in the, diff in the free zone I just created. So here was the demo session. Thanks a lot for your attention and I will now hand over to Laura. Uh, okay, so I think now it's, we've, uh, we've seen uh, the use case, we've seen uh, the demo, uh, so uh, now I think it's time for, uh, it's time for a session of Q&A. Perfect, absolutely. Um, there's a couple of questions that have come in actually, so I'll, I'll answer them. I'll ask me them. Um, I don't know which one of you is appropriate to answer, so please do just pick it up if you if you have an answer. Um, the first question I have here is: um, Is Hadoop mandatory when implementing a big data project? Okay, we often get this uh, questions and remark from our customers. Um, because Hadoop is often seen as a kind of universal magical recipe and it's true that uh, Hadoop itself uh, in managing unstructured or semi-structured data uh, in very large amounts but um, for structured data such as the ones uh, operators deal with there are many other very efficient technologies uh, because they leverage on powerful indexing capabilities a uh, second point to take into account is that Hadoop is a great fit for staging vast amounts of raw data, but is not that great at real-time analytics because it was not designed for it. And, um, and last, managing Hadoop technology is complex and requires a real investment in a cluster management team in addition to infrastructure. So certainly uh, Hadoop is, uh, is a standard but it's not a magical tool and so depending on the project one can perfectly opt for um, Hadoop for certain types of storage and application and other databases uh, technologies on top of it that may prove more efficient. So in, in, in our case we chose um, to, have, to be Hadoop compliant but not necessarily to rely on Hadoop technology for all types of applications. Mm -hmm. Great. Anything else to add, or should I move on to the next question? Yeah, no, I think that uh, that would be my answer. <laughs> Very thorough. <laughs> um, great. So the next question I have here is, um, should someone hire data scientists to run the project? Um, to run the project, probably not. But uh, the question, the question is, do you need data scientists afterwards when it's uh, in mm -hmm. place? And and uh, I think it really depends on the type of application you're planning to deploy. Um, for applications that deal with your core business skills, for example, uh, if you're working on churn prediction, uh, if you're working on segmentation, if you're working on uh, network planning, or uh, next best offer algorithm, um, yeah, you would rather internalize in, in your team uh, competencies of data scientists because you want to data mine yourself and maybe even if you buy an algorithm on the market, you'd like to fine tune it in order to, uh, uh, to make it the most relevant possible uh, to, your, to your own use case. But for known core business applications, you may just rely on off-the-shelf algorithm. For example, if if you um, if you if you're dealing with a geostatistics uh, algorithm that calculate trajectories, uh, speeds, means of conveyance from mobile data, you may not want to invest a lot of time and resources to fine-tune these algorithm, and might be that. Uh, uh, for these applications, it would be a reasonable choice to rely on external skills or uh, from vendors or on specialized consultants that do it all the time 
uh, instead of uh, uh, recruiting and hiring uh, data scientists just for this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the next question I have is, is it better to have an on-premises installation or to use the cloud? Mm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's a tricky one. Yeah. Um, I would say both solutions are possible and they, they both have uh, benefits and drawback. Um, cloud usually has lower upfront investment but uh, in the case of a big data project, it requires higher bandwidth and maybe not mature enough uh, in the area of mass storage. It evolves quickly, though. Um, so in order to optimize the TCO of your project, uh, what we see is that usually uh, it requires to mix both solutions. Um, you would do storage on-premise and applications on the cloud. But there's an, uh, also another factor to take into account, um, and it's uh, a bit the same as um, the problem of privacy uh, we've addressed earlier. When you're playing with subscribers' data, uh, even if they are often uh, anonymized, uh, operators usually don't want to take the risk of having such sensitive data outside their premises, and even less outside their country. Uh, many would fear that uh, there would be a strong backlash if it was known that their customers' personal data are processed outside their premises. And for this reason, uh, most of the operators that are working with us uh, had rather keep everything on-premise, uh, not because uh, uh, it was not a matter of performance or even cost. It was rather a general cautious policy uh, based on this, uh, on these issues. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, we've got time for one last question. Um, is what are the key things I need to look into before choosing my supplier? Okay, so um, I would say. Uh, uh, of the solution uh, and check that it has uh, both the capacity to integrate smoothly with your uh, existing environment uh, without, repli re without replacing or modifying everything and um, also the openness to external standards in case you want to plug other software on top of it, for example, for data visualization. Um, third point maybe to check that the, the solution has a field proven record on the market because you see many uh, theoretical solutions that haven't been deployed yet. Um, I would say it's also important to choose a solution that is not limited to one use case only, but can extend to different types of application in order to maximize uh, the return on investment you do on the platform. And uh, of course, the total cost of ownership uh, is uh, of great importance, taking into account not only the upfront costs, for software and hardware, but also recurring costs. So I would say these yeah. different points to take into account. Yeah, I definitely agree, especially on the um, the proven record and the cost side of things. Obviously, so you know you're working with a proven supplier. Great. Thank you very much, Laurent. Um, that is all we have time for question-wise today. Um, if you would like a copy of the slides or if you have any other questions following today's session, please do feel free to get in touch with Lauren directly. Um, the webinar recording will be available in the coming days and that will be sent out for you all to watch on demand as well. But thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much to all of you for your presence and attendance and I'll be glad to talk over after uh, on a one-to-one -one basis. Great. Thanks, Laurent. Thank you. Have a great, okay. night. great day. Great day.